So the discussion of what exactly life and death is on a cellular level can be just as complex and profound and religious as uh, it is on the human level. So we don't care about that. What we want to do is determine what changes that can happen in a cell or a human or a tissue or organ which would result in irreversible changes to that area and that's called death. If it's reversible it's simply called injury. Some of the classic reversible changes would be a reduction in oxidative phosphorylation, a reduction therefore in the production of ATP, and cellular swelling. These are all changes which are reversible. Uh, your mitochondria can be damaged and produce uh, decreased amounts of ATP resulting in reduced oxidative phosphorylation, but it's, it could be reversible. A cell can swell. In other words, take in water, lose the integrity of the so sodium potassium pump, and it could still come back. These are reversible changes. But when they are extreme, such as mitochondrial irreversibility or irreversible membrane defects or lysosomal digestion, these are things which are uh, absolutely uh, irreversible and will not result in the cell coming back. I was walking down the stairs uh, in one of my favorite uh, Caribbean hotels and I saw a big cockroach and I thought, oh, I wonder if it's alive. So I looked closely and I saw a bunch of little ants eating it. So I thought, well, you know, if uh, something is uh, already digesting, it's probably not alive. Uh, same is true with uh, lysosomes. Once your lysosomes start to uh, digest your cell, uh, there's no way it's coming back. So reversible changes are regarded as injury and irreversible changes are regarded as death. But remember, many reversible changes can or often, if prolonged or severe enough, will lead to irreversible changes. So all of the reversible changes we saw like here, can eventually lead to irreversible changes or death. And what are some of these things which cause death, injury? Well, I always refer to them as the usual suspects. I'm not too sure if you've seen that movie. It's one of my favorite movies. And uh, in the usual suspects, we can always identify three classical agents. Physical, chemical, infectious. Physical, those are always the main ones. Physical, chemical, infectious. These are always discussed when we talk about carcinogenesis, birth defects or teratogenesis, inflammations, or any disease in general. Sure, there's a bunch of other things, but these are the three main categories of injury. Decreased oxygen or hypoxia, decreased nutrients, perhaps immunologic uh, causes. Uh, genetic causes, nutritional causes. Not that they are all completely separate categories, but if you like to think of things in terms of three, which we often do, because I really can't remember anything past three, uh, I think physical, chemical, uh, infectious. Uh, what are some of the injury mechanisms which are reversible? Well, we've kind of mentioned them before. But if a cell has decreased ATP or mitochondrial damage without mitochondrial death, that's a reversible change. In it, a cell may take up increased calcium. So increased calcium in a cell is a uh, result of injury, and it's a reversible change. The same is true with free radicals. Free radicals are extremely dangerous, and increased free radicals is a source of injury but it can be reversible. Increased cell membrane permeability is also a reversible change. But once again, any of these things, if they result in the extreme amount, like mitochondrial death, or irreversibly increased cell membrane permeability, these are things which will then cause death. So it's easy to, to find death, but it's hard to define life. Death is simply uh, in a cell irreversible mitochondrial dysfunction and or profound membrane disturbances. And 
uh, whatever life is, we can leave that to the philosophers. Let's talk about uh, looking at uh, injuries and deaths uh, morphologically. I guess as you progress from uh, reversible to irreversible changes and then death, which is the same as irreversible, you can very early see changes at the electron micros microscopy level. Uh, followed closely at the light microscopy level and eventually grossly and sometimes these are not really that far apart sometimes uh, gross appearance of a dead tissue can come very early uh, after the actual death here's an EM in which you can see microvilli and well-formed vesicles and organelles in the cytoplasm this is cells alive and as functioning anatomically as it could be you can start to see some dissolution perhaps of the organelles and some uh, irregularities along the membrane, perhaps a few vesicles that normally shouldn't be there. This is an injured cell. Here's a dead cell at the bottom in which there's complete loss of um, membrane uh, integrity and therefore extreme uh, vesicle and uh, fluid formation inside the cell. This is normal, that's injured, and that's dead. At the light microscopy level, you can think of uh, a normal myocardium here. You could see nuclei, you could see capillaries. One of the first thing that happens in death at the light microscopic level is to have loss of the nuclei. And once that tissue is dead, it acts as a trigger for acute inflammation, which we will discuss in great detail in the next chapter, in which you now have infiltration of neutrophils, a loss of uh, nuclei, these are all very, very early changes, but probably not quite as early as what you might see on uh, electron microscopy. Let's talk about necrosis, which is defined as uh, cell or tissue death and its appearance. There are classically a lot of adjectives for necrosis. Some of them are classical, some of them are logical, some of them are just something you have to remember. Uh, a lot of times when you have a, a term and you want to know the common uh, words which come before it, there's a mechanism in Yahoo where you can look at the most likely words to precede other words. So if you uh, hear the word necrosis and you want to know what classically the most common adjectives are before the word, like liquefactive necrosis, gangrenous, fibrinoid, caseous, fat, ischemic, aseptic, uh, you, could, you could Yahoo it, or perhaps there's a mechanism in Google now as well. Uh, liquefactive necrosis is necrotic tissue that has turned into liquid and classically and almost exclusively this is re, uh, referring to brain necrosis. Gangrenous necrosis is a type of ischemic necrosis in which uh, extremities, bowel perhaps, organs uh, are dead and in the early stages of death, where there's still a lot of fluid present because of the uh, acute inflammatory hyperemic reaction, this may be talked of as being wet gangrene. As time goes on, the water may be absorbed. It's called dry gangrene. Often the term fibrinoid necrosis is used particularly in rheumatic or autoimmune diseases uh, to describe changes seen in the walls of blood vessels. This is a very elusive type of necrosis. Almost always specifically refers to uh, rheumatoid blood vessels or other autoimmune diseases. Caseous necrosis is seen in tuberculosis and it's because the word caseous means cheese and it is a gross word, not a microscopic word. It means you cut something it has a consistency of cheese so it's called caseous necrosis. Fat necrosis is necrosis of fat, usually due to trauma, has characteristic changes. Ischemic necrosis is uh, uh, due to lack of blood or oxygen. And avascular necrosis is almost identical with ischemic necrosis. Have to end now.